and we're glad you are here today. Well, this is the second in a series of four, uh, each off of a letter, as you see the word give up on the screen, G-I-V-E. Last week was generosity, and that's the foundation for all the other ones that we'll be talking about. You're going to hear a lot about generosity today, today as well. And, and so this in the second week, I, I want to just remind you that these letters stand for something significant. Generosity, and today we're going to talk about inspiration. Next week we'll talk about vision. And then the final one is going to be talking about effectiveness. Now if you weren't here last week, we learned that the more that we give, the more we receive. Now this isn't some magical formula, you know, rub the genie bottle and anything like that. But uh, we see this pattern. We, we know this is true if we've experienced this personally. The more generous we are with our money, with our possessions, with our time, the more likely it is we receive those things that money can't buy. Things like happiness and health and, and a greater sense of meaning and purpose in life. So while money itself can't make us happy, giving it away actually can. And the more we give, statistically it shows the better off we are, the happier we are, the healthier we are. And, and I referenced a book last week, it's a book called The Paradox of Generosity, and, and the question that book never actually answers, and the answer I didn't give last week is, why do people give in the first place? What breathes life into our generosity? What influences us to take those things that God has given to us and then freely give them away? Because, you know, sometimes the economy's tight. Sometimes our wallet is thin. Sometimes the checking balance is low. Sometimes our financial future is a little uncertain. Why should we give away some of that security? Why should we give away our money, our time, our treasure, our talents? When we're already so busy, why should I volunteer more? When I've got all this going on in life, how can I afford to take a couple mornings off to go work at VBS? Well, as I mentioned, volunteering helps us feel better in the long run. Now, usually we don't just wake up one morning and decide, I want to go and, you know, give my life away, right? We just don't have those impulses generally. We don't just wake up one day and all, all of a sudden have become generous. Something has to inspire us. Now, with VBS, I think that's an easy inspiration, right? We get to pour the gospel into little sponges, into children, and as we put the imprint of the gospel on children, they take that into the world wherever they go for the rest of their lives. That's awesome. That's inspiration to me. I want to be part of that. Right? I hope you do too. hope you're excited about that like I'm excited about that. Now the word inspiration means someone or something that has an influence, that causes an action, that causes us to do something. That's what inspiration is. If we're inspired, it's a trigger. It, it pushes us out there to go do something, right? It's motivating force behind how it is we go about living our lives. And inspiration is what breathes life into our actions and helps us do the things we might not normally otherwise do. Now, most people who are generous have embraced that as a lifestyle, right? That giving, not just of money, but of all things, is a lifestyle. And those who do it well and do it generously have been inspired in some way. And many times, as we see them give, their giving is an inspiration to us as well. Right? That's how that often works. You see somebody be generous, and then you want to be generous like they were. The greatest influence on our personal giving and the greatest inspiration to live generous lives ourselves comes from the example of the people who are immediately surrounding us in our lives. The people that we have seen give personally. Now frankly, I find it incredibly inspiring that somebody like Warren Buffett and Bill Gates have pledged billions of dollars to give away, right? I mean, 
I can't imagine what a billion dollars is. I don't suspect in my lifetime I will ever have a checking account with a billion dollars in it, right? So, so that's impressive, but it doesn't inspire me. It's those people around me, those people immediately who inspire me with generosity. People who've never met me before who let me live in their house for a while. That's kind of inspirational. Jim and Gloria did that, right? Not to point them out, but it's those things locally. It's your friends, it's your family, it's your neighbors. When somebody in your life is actually generous, that's when you're inspired to be generous. It's not somebody somewhere else being generous that inspires us most of the time. It's usually right there at home. We are inspired by the people in our lives who have given in ways that have touched us and they have become our role models for giving because they have shown us on a personal level what it means to give. So question, who has inspired you? Who has shown you what generosity looks like? Who challenges you to give more of your time, more of your energy, more of your money, and causes you to give a larger portion of yourself? Let me tell you a story of generosity, and then we're going to jump into some scripture. This is a story of generosity that I experienced firsthand. Years ago, I was part of a church, a church called Northridge Baptist Church. Uh, this was back when I lived in Mitchell, South Dakota. Northridge is one of our conference churches. Uh, they're in the Heartland District, whatever name they changed to, I don't know. But Central South Dakota, we'll leave it at that. If you don't know about Mitchell... Um, Mitchell is the church, this Northridge Baptist is the church I would largely consider my home church. And it's not my home church because I came to faith there. No, I became a Christian back in college. Um, it's, it's just this church where I grew spiritually like no other time of my life. I was there for three and a half years and it felt like I was there for an eternity but in a good way. Because I was growing, and they let me try new things, and they, they let me experiment, and I got to lead Bible studies and youth groups and sing on a praise and worship team. You, you, you may not know my backstory, but when you see me up here singing, it's a miracle. And I'm not kidding. For the first 18 years of my life, well, not probably all 18 of them, but for the most of my life, before I came to faith, I refused to sing in church. My parents sing in the church choir to this day. They're both, my dad particularly, my dad sings in a barbershop uh, choir. He's a, he's a wonderful singer. And my rebellion against my family was to not sing. My brother's a great singer. My mom's a good singer. So the, the way I rebelled was to not sing in church. And so when I told my parents I was singing on a praise team, they were quite flabbergasted, frankly. And I got that experience at Northridge. They were very generous towards me and let me try those kinds of things. And so I grew up spiritually there. I was baptized there. And it was from there that I launched into seminary. I had a career before I was a pastor. That's what brought me to Mitchell. And this church gave me so many opportunities that I couldn't resist the call of God in my heart to go and, and to do this full time. And so not only did they confirm for me that I was gifted into the ministry, but then they gave me some money to go to seminary and, and they sent me with their blessing and they, 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 they were just tremendous in their support of me over the years with prayer and everything else. I am the pastor I am today largely out of an influence from that church. Now if you're not familiar with Mitchell itself, of course, Mitchell is the home of the Corn Palace. How many of you have ever been to the Corn Palace, right? Yeah, the Corn Palace, right? I lived two blocks from the Corn Palace, that big corny palace. Um, it's kind of an eyesore, but it's kind of cool. It's decorated in art, and all the art on the outside is made of corn. It's the world's biggest bird feeder. Uh, that's what we used to call it, right? Now, Mitchell, Mitchell being located in South Dakota is, as the whole state of South Dakota primarily is, largely based on a farm economy. And our church at Northridge reflected that. We had a number of families, even though our church was technically in town, and, and I'm talking technically because six feet beyond the back wall of the sanctuary was a fence and there was cows on the other side. Seriously, sometimes you'd hear them mooing while we were trying to sing. But we were technically a town church, 
But despite that, we had a number of farm families who would come into town and, and celebrate and worship with us. And one of those families had recently sold off a number of their cows and one of their bulls. And as they did this, they received what they really thought was a significant windfall. That bull brought a lot more money than they were expecting. The price of cattle had somehow miraculously leapt the day they were selling. All of it conspired together with them having a significant more amount of money from their sale than they had expected. All their bills were paid. And they prayed over, what should we do with this money? And after prayer as a family, it was a family of five, and they said, well, I think God is telling us we need to give this money away. So they went and took the roughly $2,100 overage that they had more than, that, that was more than what they'd expected. They took this $2,100, walked into the pastor's office and set it on his desk and said, God is just leading us to give this gift. No strings attached. Just do something with it. Okay? And of course, Anytime somebody walks into a pastor's office and plops down cash on the desk, we're, okay, wow, that's generous, that's, that's amazing, that's awesome, thank you. So Pastor John and the elders of the church prayed over, talked about it, figured out what is it we are going to do? How are we going to spend this? They didn't want to just put it towards a budgetary item because this wasn't a, a reoccurring gift. They, they couldn't count on it for the next year, so they didn't want it to go in the budget. But it was no strings attached, a lump sum, all just given to the church. So they prayed, they prayed, and said, what do we do with this? How do we honor this blessing? How do we honor this gift? And they came up with a plan. And it was a pretty cool plan, because here I am 15 years later telling you about it, right? So I must have been a little bit inspired. So they come up with this plan. They take that cash. They go get a bunch of envelopes, that, the church envelopes, and they start taking 10s and 20s and sticking them in church envelopes until $2,100 stuffed into church envelopes. And then that following Sunday when we come to church, there was a basket with a bunch of white envelopes that nobody other than the couple of elders and the lead pastor knew what was in it. And, and as part of the worship, they said, everybody come forward, don't open them, but come forward and grab one of these envelopes. And so we all went back, we sat down, we're holding this envelope, what is this? And they told us this story. They said, we're starting something new. This is a one-time deal. It's a cow campaign. Change our world. And then they told us the backstory where the money had come from a cow. So it made sense, right? And they told us we were to take these envelopes and take the money that was in them and just go be a blessing. The only rules we were given was we had to bless somebody else. We couldn't spend it on ourselves. And we weren't actually supposed to say specifically where the money came from unless somebody asked. Okay? So here we are sitting here with free money. $2,100 as a church to go out. And the challenge also said we had to spend it in the next three days. Okay? We could spend it on anything. We could go buy groceries. We could pay for somebody's gas, buy somebody coffee, buy somebody lunch. I know a couple of people pooled their money together and paid for somebody's light bill who, whose bill was overdue. And not only that, a bunch of the people at the church said, well, I'm going to double that. And so reached in their wallet and doubled whatever they found inside of there. So instead of giving 10 or 20, they give 40 or 60 or 80. And then and, and this pot starts to grow. And so, so we go out as a church. Three days, we give this money out in the town of Mitchell. Right? I went and I bought somebody gas and mine was gone. Now we come back to church the next Sunday expecting to hear some cool stories. And there were some cool stories. We got to hear some amazing stories of how people blessed other people and how people were touched by that. But not only was this generosity a source of really cool sto stories, but something really strange happened. We started getting thank you cards from people at the church. And not only did we start getting thank you cards, we started getting thank you checks and cash to the point at which a week later, more had been sent into the church than we had given out. Now that was by no means our intent. And now all of a sudden, the elders were scratching their head going, that's not what we really wanted to happen. What do we do with this money? So they got some more envelopes. They stuck it in and we went and did it again, right? And we went out a second time and blessed our community. And just were radically generous. 
And of course, a little bit more money came back in and, and slowly but surely that cycle wanes. But this change our world had a huge impact on our community. Just because of one family's generosity. They said, God had given us more than we expected. We need to return some of that to him. And so they gave, and it created all kinds of amazing connections. There's people to this day who have been baptized, who come to know Jesus, and who go to that church because somebody bought their gas at a gas station in Mitchell, South Dakota, because somebody sold a cow, somebody sold a bull. That's inspirational giving. That's what we did. And those are the kind of stories that impact us because generosity by nature is inspiring. Seeing people's generous giving inspires us to also be generous. And that's why Jesus himself pointed out the giving of others and wanted their stories to be shared. In fact, Jesus shares a story, and it's a story I touched on, I kind of stole from this week, last week. But Jesus shares this story. If you want to follow along, it comes from Luke 21, 1 through 14. And he shares this story that, that this story might be perhaps the source of the greatest amount of giving in the history of the church. This one story. And Jesus tells this story so that we would be inspired by it. Luke 21, 1 through 4 says this. It says that Jesus looked up and he saw the rich putting their gifts in an offering box. And he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. So in other words, it's not about quantity. It's about sacrifice. Don't mistake giving something for being generous. The widow gave sacrificially and experienced great personal cost. She gave her best and she gave it willingly. She worshipped God that day and she fully put her trust in Him. And now because of her generosity and her trust in the Lord and in the Lord's provision for her, Jesus lifts her up, lifts up her generosity as a means of inspiration for us. She was willing to give, and by sharing her story, Jesus is inspiring us to do the same. Now, as I mentioned last week, I preach this after we've already taken offering, right? I'm not preaching, so you give us more. I mean, you can. That's okay. But that's not the point. And it's not about just giving money. I want to be abundantly clear. Generosity is a heart issue. Generosity is giving of your time, your treasure, your talents. There's lots of ways to be generous that don't involve money. Money is just one thing. There's many ways we need to be a generous people. And when we are willing to give in simple and in generous ways, without seeking reward or recognition for ourselves, God will use that to inspire and influence others in our lives. I suspect every one of us in this room have been inspired by somebody else's generous giving. Many of us here today have been blessed amazingly, right? I've been abundantly blessed in life. I'm not the richest guy. I drive a 95 Ford Ranger and a 97 Honda Accord, right? I'm not living large, but I have food to eat, clothes to wear, and a roof over my head. And if I have those three things, I'm blessed beyond measure, folks. I have more than two-thirds of the world just by having those three things. I am abundantly blessed. I'm filthy rich by the standards of this world. And I want you to hear this. Let me be clear. I never, ever want to guilt somebody for being blessed. If God has blessed us, praise the Lord. Use it for His glory. Don't feel guilty that God has blessed you, but use it for His glory. But what I would like to do is inspire you and challenge you a little bit to examine those blessings in the context of the expectation that God has put upon us when he gives us those blessings. 
Think of the most generous person that you know. How does that person make you feel? Are you inspired by generosity like I am? We all have the capacity to be that generous person. And as I said, generosity extends far beyond just money. I think one of the very most important ways we as Christians need to be a generous people is in forgiveness. Would you like to be known as a person who is generous in forgiveness? Somebody who forgives when they are wronged? I would love to be known as that. I would love to have people at my funeral talking about how I forgave them rather than about my collection of stamps, right? How about you? We can be generous in service and in love and many other ways and not have to spend a dime. Now many of us in this room have children or grandchildren or even great-grandchildren, right? How many of you want to be an inspiration to them to be generous? How many of you want to use your influence and what God has given you and gifted you to impact their lives so that the next generation is also generous? I would hope it's all of us, right? And what inspires us to give is this atmosphere in which we grow up in. And the truth of the matter is we're all still growing up in some sense. We can all still be inspired by somebody else's giving in some way, shape, or form. Watching others give, seeing what giving has done in their lives influences us. And I want the people of Glory Baptist Church to be known as inspirational people in their generosity. Now, as Christians, our story is the story of generosity, isn't it? Think about all the stories about Jesus, right? There's a lot of them. Think about all the stories about Jesus and all the places where he was generous to others and how inspirational those stories are. Remember his very first ministry? His very first miracle. What was that? Turns water into wine, right? Did you know that's a story of generosity? Jesus is at a wedding. They've been squeezing the wineskins for a while, right? They've been having a party. Somebody got married, having a good time. The wine's running out. What do we do? Well, Mary goes, Jesus, can you do something about this? All right. Sure, Mom. I don't think sure Mom's actually in the Bible, but I'm sure it was probably said in Aramaic somehow, right? So Jesus transforms water into wine. But, not only does he do that, he doesn't just, like, make table wine. He doesn't, I mean, they've been drinking, it's a party. So he could probably just make some mediocre wine and call it a day. No! Instead, Jesus brings the good stuff, right? The best stuff that was served at the party that day. People go, Usually when you go to a wedding, usually when you go to a party, they give the good stuff first, and then as you drink a little, it kind of tapes, tapers off, you get to the rot gut. Well, not at this party. They give us the good stuff last. It's a story of generosity. Jesus gives them the good stuff. Or how many times do we have to forgive somebody, Jesus? Right? The guys, Jesus' guys come up to him. How many times do we have to forgive somebody? How about seven times? Because, I mean, Jesus, you know, seven. Seven's more than, seven's more than we're supposed to forgive as Jews. I mean, we, we can get away with giving like three or four forgivens, but seven. Let's forgive people seven times, Jesus. Is that, is that enough, Jesus? Can we just forgive like seven times? Is that enough? No. Seventy-seven. What? Have you lost your mind, Jesus, seventy-seven times? How many times do I have to forgive Jesus? Seventy. Seven? What are you talking about, man? That's a lot, right? And Jesus' point isn't actually 77 times. His point is forgive and keep forgiving and forgive again. And when you are slighted, forgive again and turn the other cheek and forgive again. And when they do it to you again, forgive them again, right? Matthew eighteen twenty one. that's where that story comes from. How many of you have ever screwed up really bad? Done something that you thought, I don't know if they're going to forgive me for this one. 
Right? You ever done that? Most of us probably did that to our parents at some point in time. Right? And when you were forgiven, or if you were forgiven, how did that make you feel? Let me put it to you this way. How many of you sinned today? What, I'm the only sinner? (laughs) You don't have to raise your hands, I'm kidding. How many of you sinned yesterday? Or the day before? Or the day before that? Right? In your life, how many times have you sinned? If we were to take account, if there was somebody following you each time, you know, like one of those clickers, and, and click, oh, there's another sin, there's another sin, you're probably, right now you're thinking, shut up, pastor, i got to get to lunch, click, that's a sin. Right? We'll add that to your tally. How many times have we sinned? How many times have we fallen short of the glory of God? Remember, his standard is perfection, right? How many times have we looked at a passing girl for just a little bit too long? How many times have we looked at our neighbor's boat and said, ooh, I'd really like one of those. I mean, I got the 100 horse, but he's got the 150 horse. I mean, come on. I could really get to the fish faster with that baby. Right? How many times have you yelled at somebody in traffic and maybe communicated to them non-verbally in the Twin Cities? Even if you didn't, how many times did you think it? That's a sin. Jesus says so. Sinners, right? How many times have we bent the truth, omitted part of a story, covered up for someone else? How many times have we lied about our weight on our driver's license? Can you imagine sitting in hell for all of eternity because you lied on your driver's license? Seriously. And so since we all lie about our weight on our driver's license and we do a whole lot of other bad stuff too, we need a savior, right? We can't save ourselves, can we? What do we need? We need Jesus. We need a radically generous God. And if this doesn't inspire you to generosity, then nothing will, frankly, I think. Jesus gave willingly of himself, literally, out of generosity. He knew you couldn't do it. You didn't have it. You didn't have enough in you to make it through life sinless and unblemished. And so, Jesus gave all that he had until he had nothing, literally, more to give. He knew the cost of his generosity and he gave it all anyhow. Let me remind you of a couple of words of Jesus. Words that he shared while he was on the cross. Here's Jesus' generosity. This is what Jesus said. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Right? He'd been whipped, beaten, nails pounded through him. He'd been lied about. His, one of his best friends had turned his back on him and denied him. One of his close followers had sold him out for a bag of coins. And yet, here we find Jesus in his final act, being generous, saying, Father, forgive them. The I in give is inspiration. And I hope you're feeling a little bit of that right now. Because I believe in this church, there lies incredible potential to change the world. To change the world around us, in the community of Aiken, on our lake homes around the lake, in the cabins where we live, wherever we are. I believe God has empowered this church and blessed this church and the people of this church to make a difference. We can make a difference in our community, through our families, and in our world. Because God has blessed us. God has equipped us to do so. And as I close this message today, I want to have you briefly, if you want, pull out your sermon notes and look at those for a second. They're in your bulletins if you want to look at them. You don't have to. They're there. You can take them home with you. But this is your homework. I want you to think this through today and this week. Maybe take this and talk this over at lunch. Maybe if you go to the Red Door or you're at the Pine Inn or your Glen Store or you're at the 40 Club or wherever you're going for lunch. Maybe you're barbecuing today. 
Take a minute and talk about this. If you've never talked to your kids about generosity, I don't care how old your kids are, maybe have a conversation with them this week. One of the things to think about is, where do you find inspiration for generosity? The second thing is, can you name two people? You don't have to do it out loud, but can you name two people who have shown you what generosity looks like? And if you're able, maybe follow up with them and ask them about that generosity. And then think about what you can learn from them and how you can apply that to your own life. Third, be intentional and think about ways that you could be giving in a way that will be inspirational to others. And then fourth and finally, put it into action. Put it into action. We can read the Bible all day, but if we don't live it out, it's all for naught. It was wasted. We fed ourselves and made ourselves fat, but we didn't bring glory to God. You want to bring glory to God? Live it out. Be inspiringly generous. Find a place that matches with your passions and give your time, your treasure, your talents. Be a light into the world. Be generous beyond belief that God would receive the glory in it. Not so that we might receive any in, anything in return, but simply that we might make much of Jesus who gave it all to us to begin with. In every church I've ever served in, there's been people who have been incredibly generous, who have inspired me, myself, to give more, to live more freely, to give more abundantly. Let us be those people. I hope and pray this week that somehow, some way, this message will have implanted into your hearts and into your minds that somewhere along the way this week, God's going to tap you on the shoulder and say, here's your chance. Give joyously, give generously, give abundantly, because God has given it all to us. It's all His, and it's all going back to Him. We can't take it with us. So let us be a people who are generous. Amen. Amen? Amen. Let us pray.